Well, welcome to the show, Brett. Great to have you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. I was very curious about the title of your book. So we get a lot of leadership books, and surfing is not really something that immediately comes to mind when one thinks of military leadership. So what does surf when you can mean to you? I think surfing means a lot to me in different ways. Um, one, I enjoy the physical activity. Uh, I grew up in California, and uh, if I was stationed somewhere that had a beach and I had my surfboard, I'd always try to figure out a way to go surfing. But I think over the years, surfing became kind of just a way for me to remind myself the importance of taking a break from all the other things that kind of hit you day to day. And, you know, you got to put your cell phone down. You got to get on the water. Uh, hopefully you're out there with some good buddies. And, I, and so it's a, a chance not just to have some physical exercise and have fun and enjoy that, but but also to really think and a chance to kind of sit back and contemplate. And I think sometimes, uh, particularly in our busy world, and whether it's the military or not, you know, there's, we have so much information at our disposal, emails and texts and phone calls and feeds and whatnot. And so, you know, unless, unless you're someone that wants to bring out a waterproof bag with a, with a, you know, a cell phone, which is generally pretty frowned upon, uh, you just have to be out there with you, your board, the weather, the waves and uh, enjoy it. And, and, you know, obviously the clips of people surfing are that you're on these big waves, but, you know, to be fair, most of the time surfing's about paddling out, getting out there and, you're only probably spending about 5% of your time actually on a wave surfing. So there is a lot of time to think. And, you know, and I, I, I like to run. I like to work out too. And if, if you ever follow me on a run, I'm probably one of those people that stops every mile or so to pull out their phone and write something on a, like a notepad. Cause you're, you know, you're thinking and these things come up, which a little bit harder on a surfboard. Um, but maybe that's why it appeals to me. And I think that, you know, as, as you become more senior in leadership roles, you cannot underestimate the importance of just taking a break and thinking about, you know, what it is you want to focus on, what it is you want to prioritize and how you can do that. Otherwise you just become a slave to email and, and trying to process information as fast as you can. So, so that's why I like to surf and I just like being on the water. Yeah. I figured part of the Navy background in you as well. Yeah. I'd love to hop in the time machine and think back to when you first enrolled in the Naval Academy, what goals did you have for your Navy career? And how did you envision it going versus where we sit now? And so obviously, you know, young 18-year-old Brett, as it were, uh, heavily influenced by a movie that came out in 1986 called Top Gun. I just wanted to fly. And I, you know, I would have skipped college. I would have gone right to flight school and, and done what I saw in the movie. So um, smarter people prevailed and made sure I understood there's a path to get there that entails like going to college and learning about engineering and sciences and leadership. And the Naval Academy does a great job of teaching people about the fundamentals of leadership. Um, you know, they don't teach necessarily how to do it. They just teach you some of the prerequisites that you need to think about on developing as a leader. So, you know, when I got to the Naval Academy, I, I realized, okay, I had to study a little bit to, to get to flight school. And that was still became my primary goal. And without a doubt, I joined the Navy to fly. Um, I didn't really put much thought into it beyond that. That's what I wanted to do. I and I love flying. I flew helicopters for 10 years. I flew fighters for 20, but I didn't stay for flying. Um, and I'm often asked now, like, do I fly now? And I don't, um, I stayed for the people. I stayed for the people I met along the way and, and the people that gravitated to that line of work and folks focused on a mission greater than themselves. And, and that's why I stayed. And that's why I enjoyed it. And the flying became a great, maybe a great distraction at times and a great hobby and a, and, a, but, but you put a lot of time into it because, I think to be successful in the military, you have to balance your role. Uh, for me personally, you know, yourself, your family, you have to balance your role as a warrior. You have to understand your profession, your trade. And as you stay in long enough, you have to understand the importance of being a leader. And those three things, you know, family, your your profession and leadership all kind of tie together in some way. So I think I went from young 18-year-old, just want to fly Tomcats off a of flight deck to, hey, flying's cool. I like doing that. Um but leading people and being part of the team is even more rewarding in the end. I would imagine at a younger age, the flying itself is the carrot uh, that makes you want to do everything yeah. else because that is the reward that makes every, <laughs> everything else yeah. Yeah. acceptable to be doing, right? And there's like, why else would you put yourself through all of this without that um, of being – being in the sky. Yeah. I mean, much like surfing lets you get away from uh, the day-to-day -day grind and your business job, whatever you have now. Flying in a way is like that. There's And there's a huge adrenaline rush, um, whether you're flying helicopters or fighters. And and you do. You feel lucky. I mean, even 
even I was the commanding officer of the aircraft carrier towards the end of my career, I was still flying helicopters and I was still flying fighters and I was still driving the ship and running, you know, a 5,000 person crew. So I felt pretty lucky when amongst all the chaos and things that it takes to run and manage a 5,000 person ship that I could go jump on an F-18, take off and, and then just hang out overhead the ship and, and watch it and, and relax a little bit. So it was my, it was my way of surfing while I was uh, in command. So definitely remained a carrot to the end. So I definitely enjoyed it. Well, when we think about Top Gun, we think often about the rugged individualism, the heroism that goes along with being a pilot, but that doesn't really fly in, in real life, right? You've mentioned teamwork yeah. a few times now. So how has your fighter pilot experience influenced your leadership? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you think of the movie, even the most recent one, which I love, and they did a great job, and it's very focused on the individual. And uh, I mean, there's some element of teamwork in the sky with your wingman and your your backseater and stuff, but but it's obviously much more than that. You know, I, I often found that when I was sitting in my my captain's chair on the you know on the aircraft carrier bridge and and watching a, a fighter, you know, F-18 take off, I mean, there's literally thousands of people that had to work to get that to where that aircraft could launch. I mean, whether it's the folks running the reactors, the folks making water for the steam, the food, the laundry, I mean, it's a city and all 5,000 are focused on that one mission. It's not about just getting the ship from point A to point B. It's about getting the ship somewhere and launching those aircraft. And when you're, you know, when you're younger, I think, and you're doing it for the first couple of times, you're just so excited about it. You, you might lose some of that understanding, but as you get more senior, you realize that it does, it takes takes that 18 year old kid on the flight deck that checks you out one last time before he hits the button to launch you. I had a sailor that worked for me that was driving the ship. So she was the helmsman on the ship and she didn't even have her driver's license, but she had joined the Navy and now we had taught her how to drive an aircraft carrier. And, and it takes all of that. So I think, again, as you get more senior and your perspective broadens maybe a little bit and you understand that it, it is, it's all about teamwork. You wouldn't even think about being able to take off by yourself, which is why now when I, you know, when people talk about, Hey, do you want to go fly? civilian flying. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't quite understand the same, you know, the teamwork that's going on. I mean, I know there is, and there's ways that it's very safe to do, but you know, I, it's, it's not like having a team of 5,000 to make sure you get off safely, uh, successfully every time. So I think that's, that's what I think is you, I think it's important to understand that you're, it's a privilege to fly. It's a privilege to fly Navy aircraft. And it comes because of those thousands of people that are making that happen for you. What stood out to me in the missions that you describe in the book is the teamwork outside of just the Americans. So when we think about the military and even the work that we do in training the military, we often think about the relationships built internally with your peers and with your commanding officers. But a lot of the missions you were on involved the locals and teaming up with other military forces and working cross cultures and even with language barriers to build and forge trust. How did you approach building those relationships outside of the U.S. military to achieve the mission goals that you had? Yeah, extremely important, um, particularly in the Navy, because obviously the whole reason we as a nation have a Navy is so we can theoretically fight an away game, right? We can we can send our Navy where it needs to go to protect the interest of our allies, uh, our nation. And that requires, you know, the alliance with our allies, wherever they're Japan, Europe, Italy, you name it. Um, we have some really strong allies and, and it can be hard to fight with them sometimes because there's different radios and, and language barriers. But in the end, they always say it's, you know, while it's hard to, to fight with them, it's much harder to fight without them. But on an individual level, particularly when you're ashore or at a meeting or staff, it's very easy, I think, for language barriers to to prevent you from wanting to reach out like you would maybe somebody that speaks English as their first language. But it's a really small barrier. I mean, once you get over that, and, and to be fair, most of the world speaks English pretty well. Um, you know, my foreign language skills are, are minimal at best. But once you kind of get over that, that hesitation, and you learn how to communicate with or without words sometimes, I think it, it, it kind of dawns on you that we are just all the same. We just happen to speak a different language, or we grew up in a different country. But we really come back to, you know, we're all, particularly in that line of work, it's very similar. They're focused on family. They're focused on their career. They're focused on their profession. They're making a living and doing what they can to take care of their interests. And, and that aligns with what we do every day. So I think when you, when you come down to the base level and you just get to talk one-on-one -on -one or you share espresso with the Italians or whoever you're working with or sake when you're in Japan, um, yeah, we, it's, it's fun. And I actually really enjoy it. And they're fascinated by our culture. We're fascinated by theirs. And if you just kind of humble yourself a little bit and, and open yourself up and, 
and understand they're just, you know, they're just eager to, to be part of the team. Then I think there's amazing things you can learn and do. And I, we, we benefit, we lived in Italy for a couple of years, my, my entire family, we lived in Japan for a couple of years and it was really fun to be part of those cultures and learn about, you know, the folks, not only do we, are we call allies, we might fight with if required. And certainly we became friends along the way. Yeah. That rule you have never skip espresso. So you talk about essentially having this mission, having this pressure on you, got to get the task done. And here the Italians are stopping to have a coffee. And American coffee culture is a little bit different than Italian yeah. coffee culture. And your reticence at first to participate, hey, guys, we got to get this task done. What are we doing here? Taking a break for coffee. Um, but what you learned about that and creating this rule, can you unpack that for our audience and, and how you approach relationships? Yeah. And I think, you know, just to set the scene a little bit, obviously, you know, I think about when I go to Starbucks or something, I'm usually driving through or get my order and on the run to whatever my next meeting is. Um, you might go share coffee with somebody, but it's, you know, it's a, it's probably more rare than, um, than you'd care to admit. And in Italy and even in Japan too, they spend a lot more time, I think, finding ways to take those breaks to socialize outside of work or even just a break from work. And espresso is a great way. And I, I tell you, I've become a I mean, I had my two espresso shots this morning with my Italian coffee maker that I bought, you know, 12, 13 years ago. And it reminds me every time. So, yeah, I found myself in a job, a NATO headquarters job in Italy. And, and um, you know, I was still relatively junior in the tour. So I was super focused on making sure I answered all the emails and all my PowerPoint briefs were done on time. And, you know, I had used the correct font on the paper I had to write. So there's all these little things that aren't really that important, but I was focused on as a staff officer trying to with my standard fighter pilot type A personality, be as aggressive as possible. And the Italians and the Germans and the folks that were there in this multinational command had kind of had a different pace and and definitely hardworking. I found this out to be true later, but they took the time, I think, day to day to work on building that relationship. And so I was hesitant to go on these so-called espresso breaks that were, you know, more than more than once a day, put it that way. Like, you know, and and they don't they're not long and espresso is it's a shot, right? By design. So you, you stand up, you drink it, you socialize a little bit. And when I finally kind of slowed down a little bit and I took the time to go down and have espresso with these guys and get to learn to know them, I, what I realized I had been ignoring on my leadership and my teamwork building was the chance just to get away from the work, just to go talk about like, Hey, what's life in Naples, Italy like, or what's life in Paris like for the French that worked for us or the, you know, the guy from Berlin. I mean, and I, was, I started to really enjoy it, even though it's a short couple minutes per day, but it really helped us grow as a staff and a team. And I think in the end, when, we're, when we were challenged as a staff a couple months later, when operations in Libya kicked off, my initial assessment when I first got there that these guys were never going to be able to work hard. It was all going to be about the U.S. There's a dominant force and everyone would just kind of follow us. I realized not to be true that these guys stepped up. We, you know, they were there. They had my back every step of the way. We worked long days, seven days a week for months on end. We still took our espresso breaks, which was good as a break. But um, but a lot of that's because I think we invested as a team on the, the relationship building that was important. So so anyways, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot from that. It was a small thing. I, I think initially I learned from a guy named Luigi Fazio, who was the Italian that kept trying to encourage me to go have espresso with him. And I, I can still picture him today. And and um, I try to make a, you know a point now of, finding those moments throughout your day to kind of slow down, talk with the folks you work with, talk about stuff other than work and, and really get to know them. And you, you build a trust and you build confidence. And, you know, I think you just develop a better climate and a better command as a result of that. And I think it's important. In that and coming back in, in our individualized culture here in America, um, it took a moment for you to get used to that and have an understanding of why that was so important to them and their culture over there. Of course, you're going to come back to America. You're going to, and you're going to understand that tradition. Uh, what have you done to get others to understand and accept here in America? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's something I think that I've, I found I, I lead better when I take a break from my day to day and kind of find a way to uh, to, you know, to build those relationships with my staff or folks I work with. I mean, as I went on through my career, the Navy's really big on softball as an example. And every ship you're on has a softball team or sometimes a couple of softball teams. And, you know, I played baseball as a kid and maybe, you know, has some fundamental effect on how I wanted to lead someday. But, 
but I made a point of always joining the softball team on the ships I was on and really trying to promote it and make sure it was important because when you're on the field of softball or soccer or football or basketball, whatever your sport may be, you know, you do, you, you reduce some of the barriers, the natural barriers of, of rank in the military or position when you're not in the military, you're able to talk on a level. that's more about sports in the field. I didn't, you know, I never let them call me sir or captain. It was always chopper, my call sign or Brett and, and they enjoyed that. But I, and I really did. I think, you know, I think there's, you know, the more you, as they say, the more you bleed on the field, the less you bleed in combat. I think that was someone way more famous than, you know, the most like Patton said that, but, but I think it's important. You spend the time on the field as an example, much like a coffee break, you break down those barriers, you remove the hierarchy, you get to know each other. And then the next day at work, you tend to be more social. You tend to feel like you know the person a little bit better. It builds trust. And even now in my I'm in a nonprofit now where we help focus on veterans that have veteran issues of homelessness or drug abuse and stuff. And, and I make a point, uh, once or twice a week, I, I grab a baseball glove. I go down on the courtyard. I'll find a veteran that's, you know, wants to throw the ball around and we'll just play catch right there in the courtyard. And they really love it. And I'd love it too. One, cause I like baseball, but it's a chance to kind of remove yourself from behind the computer or on the podium or, you know, behind a microphone as it were, and kind of just relate one-on-one. And so, now, now I, I certainly still have my espresso, but I still try to play catch, you know, a couple times a week as a, as a way to, to break down those barriers. And, and the fact that stuff you learn when you do that, the veteran clients that come up to me and talk about challenges they're having or ways we can make the organization, organization better. Those are just valuable insights that you might not get if you're just stuck in your office, you know, with a secretary in front of the desk and no one can ever access you. So sometimes it's about, I think as a leader, you have to force yourself to remove those barriers to become accessible. And, and strive to do that. And on an aircraft carrier, you know, which is, again, you have all the hierarchy and stovepipes you'd expect in a large military organization. It meant you had to walk around, you know, if you weren't, couldn't play ball because you weren't in port, you could walk around and talk to folks and, and try to be as, you know, as approachable as possible. Go have lunch or something with your sailors, sit down with them. And, and after they get over the shock, they love to talk and tell you what's going on. And you just have to kind of humble yourself and, and learn. And it's not, it's not really self-serving. I mean, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed learning about folks and understanding the people that made an aircraft carrier in that case work. And, and I, and I always learned something, whether it was about them or about the ship, or I always came back with a better insight on how I could maybe lead better. So I think leaders have to make sure they're approachable, have to spend the time on the ball field or the espresso bar. Uh, and I think build those relationships to make you successful. I've certainly been in situations where the person who wanted to lead or thinks they are a leader likes to sit up in their ivory tower yelling and barking orders at everybody and, and, and stay there so that there is no retribution or no feedback uh, so they can rule from their, from their roost and not having to defend any, any of their situations. But being that leader making time to connect with them, to allow everyone to feel that we are on a team and there is a reason that we need to be connected and, and to work towards their vision. It just allows everyone in that organization and to feel appreciated. Yeah. And there's certainly a time in the military. If you're in combat, you're not going to necessarily walk around the, right. the deck plates and ask people how they like the chow or what do they, where they want to pull in next for a port call. Um, so there are those moments where you, you are up on the bridge, you're in combat, you're directing the ship or, you know, or you're, uh, you know, on the front line with a, with a team somewhere downrange and, and you've got enemy fire coming in. So those aren't obviously the moments to, you need to worry about, I think that open communication about what's going on. I mean, you're be focused on the work, but, but even then, I mean, to be a good leader, you have to be a good communicator and to be a good communicator, you have to be willing to listen. It's a two way street. And even in those combat scenarios, you better be listening to your, your trusted advisors and they better feel like they can approach you and say, you know what? Captain, you want to go this way. We actually think that's unsafe. We should go this direction or we should take that hill. I mean, you're going to be better for it. You'll be stronger as an organization. But obviously, in combat, stakes are different. It's still important to listen as much as ever. But obviously, I can see where those are times where you're going to be probably more directive. You're also leveraging that trust you built from all those other moments when you weren't in combat and you were communicating. So they trust that you're going to do you know, the right thing. I think it's an important lesson for leaders, even in your career, you didn't spend 100% of it in combat. You get deployed, you come back, you get a chance to reintegrate and then maybe get deployed again. And in business, we're not constantly in combat. We don't have to treat every day like we're in combat 
and focus solely on the task at hand. Taking the time to really get to know your team members, especially now in a work from home environment with COVID, where we seem to have less time for each other, those little moments to bond, to connect, actually make you stronger in the moments of combat and have more trust for one another in those moments when the stakes are really high. Yeah. I mean, and you probably only spend a, like a small percentage of your time, like in the single digits or less actually in combat and most in the military never do. And most in business never have, you know, a, a, a combat type scenario. So I think you're right. You have to use the other 99% of your time to build that trust, put that trust in the bank and stuff as they say. So when you have to, when you have to make those life or death decisions, they're going to trust you're going to do your best to make the right decision. They're not going to question you. Um, but it takes time. And, and, and I think you should lead, I think, with all that in a perspective, you have to know how to lead in combat, but I think you should also stand. You're not, you're rarely, if ever in combat. And most, most leaders aren't in combat throughout their entire career. You know, there's definitely life or death situations. There's definitely times when you're making decisions that affect how you operate and there's always a high risk environment. So it's not saying you don't make important decisions, but you know, truly in combat, we were talking about doing calculus on whether you're going to lose sailors or how many sailors you're going to lose. Um, that's a rare occasion for, for most leaders, obviously, which is good, which is what we want. We don't want to have to be making those kind of decisions. So that's not a bad thing. Now you mentioned the leadership training you received in the Academy. I'm curious to hear that moment as a leader where the training wasn't enough and you had to trust your instincts and you had to really lean into this leadership role. Um, I know for a lot of young leaders listening, there is this, this gut check moment where the training, the MBA program didn't cover that. We don't know what to do next, but we have to trust our instincts and make an important decision. What was that like for you? Uh, can you paint a picture of the scenario and how you worked your way through that as a leader? Yeah, I mean, I think you go back to how do we train leaders, whether it's the Naval Academy or other leadership forums. There is obviously no, it's not It's not engineering, it's not a science, right? There, there is a science to it, but it's mostly, I would argue, tends to be more art than science. So it's like, how do you teach someone how to paint? And well, one, you, you give them, you try to give them a broad experience and a broad foundation that focuses on maybe successful traits of other leaders. I used to like to read a lot of biographies about famous leaders. You know, I love reading about Admiral Nimitz and, you know, what, how he grew up through the ranks and lessons he learned along the way. And so you're really just kind of building that base. And, and then I think it's important as a leader to understand too, what your strengths are. There are, you know, some folks that are more introverted than others, and they might lead in a different style. There's others that love to; be, they're great communicators, and and uh, you put them in front of a crowd, and they can get them to do anything they want. Um, there's some that are very analytical and like the science and the math, and there's some that are more intuitive, and they tend to rely on you know understanding their advisors and making those kind of. And so, you know, there's no there's no one path or one right way to be a leader, and you have to stay true to what works for you and. And so I think as you study other leaders and you study the, the fundamentals of leadership, it, that might not work for you. It might be something different. So uh, I think that's important as you go along, you develop as a young leader, knowing you're going to have your own style. If you approach it that way, then when something happens, you're not necessarily trying to go to your playbook and try to look up the recipe for how to solve a problem because it's never going to be there, right? You're going to fall back on, okay, yeah, maybe you might think about, okay, maybe what would Nimitz have done in the situation? But more than likely, you've just kind of, you've developed a way to think over the years and how you approach problems and what your, your, your core fundamentals are. And that's generally where I found that, you know, when in doubt, you know, I, I defaulted to those types of decisions. So I think in my career, I, I learned early on that, you know, if you focus on your sailors, you focus on the people that, that you're leading, which I think is the number one fundamental of any kind of leadership role is you're taking care of your people. Um, and if you take care of your people, then they're going to take care of everything else. Um, but I found that, you know, if you, if you focus on that and you make sure when you make decisions, it stays true to that fundamental, you can really help drive a culture and you can really, I think, you know, build a, a superior organization. And I think of countless times when faced with a decision on a carrier, whether I was the XO or a squadron CO, and I always try to default to now how, you know, all right, I'm making a policy decision here that'll affect the command. How will the sailors be impacted? You know, this isn't a give everybody ice cream candy kind of thing. You know, that's not what the, that's not what your folks want. They want to be, you know, led, given the resources they need and held accountable. But if you're making an arbitrary policy because, you know, example would be you have, you know, one or two sailors get in trouble for something, right? They 
they get in trouble because they came in after curfew. Well, you could, you could then make a decision to say that, okay, we're going to, we're not going to let anybody go out or we're going to make curfew even earlier. And then you, you have to kind of step back and go, well, there's, I've had two sailors out of 500, a thousand, 5,000. Why would I make a policy that's going to impact, you know, thousands of people because, you know, I wanted this zero defect mentality. So for me, it was, you know, I knew a core belief for me was as a leader, you're taking care of your people. Let's, let's think about how you're taking care of them. How, what would be the impact if I were to arbitrarily punish 5,000 or 2,000 or even just two people that work for me because of the, you know, one or two that made a mistake. And that, that kind of helped me, I think, along the way. And I think with that, I built an effective organization. I was mindful of the impact of their time. I was mindful of the effect, you know, impact on our, uh, our mission, you know, because it all kind of, it all relates together. I, I think, again, it's leadership is science and art. There's a lot of art and it's also very personal based on your own skill sets. And you have to always understand what your fundamental tenets are, you know, which again, I, I think personally is that as a leader, you're taking care of your people and whatever scenario that is. You describing that involves a, a level of self-awareness. Where did you turn to? Did you have advisors? How did you develop that feel for your leadership style and your strengths and, and weaknesses? Well, again, I think you have to open yourself up a little bit because you're going to get feedback from no one if you're not careful, or you're going to get feedback from everybody. And you've got to, you know, understand how you filter through what's important and not, you know, you'll make decisions that are not going to be liked, no doubt. And, and you'll have to do your best to explain them, but at some point you'll have to kind of move on, but there's valuable feedback in that. And, you know, ideally, if you've made a decision that is controversial and you get pushback on it, if it's a surprise you're getting pushed back, then you probably didn't think long enough before that. You still might have made the same decision. It still might be the right decision. Um, but ideally, along the way, you've had advisors or you've opened yourself up to that feedback before that moment. And so we make decisions every day, all day long, from what you're going to wear to work to, you know, which which way you're going to drive to work. And and ideally we have feedback mechanisms in place that, you know, whether it's my wife that tells me whether I should wear what I'm wearing or not, or, you know, my app on how I get to work or at work, you know, feedback from the veteran clients who, you know, what we focus on at my nonprofit job right now. And you've got to make yourself approachable and you got to seek out, I think, that feedback. You've got to build a command where feedback is expected, not just desired. And, and if you do that, I think you can really grow quickly. So as a leader, you know, not just within the organization, but also as a leader, you've got to, to ask yourself, how, what are you doing to make sure you're getting feedback, who you're surrounding yourself with? And I used to, you know, one of the things I, I talked about in the book a little bit, we had a saying that was, it was called NKR, not quite right. And so I'd, I'd speak publicly or I'd speak in front of a large group. And at the end, I remind everybody, hey, you're all part of the same team. We're going out to do this mission. Um, I need your feedback. You know, if things are not quite right. NKR, I need you to let me know. So the point being, for those that are following along and know how to spell, you know, not quite right is NQR and NKR is not how you spell it. Um, but you say it a couple of times and initially they're like, oh, that's the captain of the ship. I'm not going to tell him that he's misspelling not quite right. You know, maybe it's me. And and that was true. I mean, first couple of times I did that, I didn't get any feedback. I kind of got it come smirks. But And then like the third time I did it, I had a sailor that stood up and said, hey, sir, you know, NKR is, you know, not the right way to abbreviate, not quite right. It's NQR. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. I used the moment, obviously, to compliment him and say, yep, that's exactly what I want. You know, you guys all have a valuable role on this team. I need your feedback um, so that if I'm going the wrong direction, you got to let me know. And you have to, when you get that feedback, even if it's wrong, even if someone tells you you're doing something wrong or you're going the wrong direction, but you know, you know, you're right. You can't discourage it. You can't bite their head off. You, that, that feedback is so valuable. It almost trumps whether the, what they're telling you is right or wrong because you want that environment where you're going to get that kind of feedback that allows you to kind of sharpen, give you that self-awareness and, and really ultimately allow you to achieve your mission more effectively. I know as a leader, part of my understanding of, of that feedback, especially in those moments where you had to make the decision, you believe the decision's right, that feedback gives you an opportunity to understand where your team's coming from and where their gaps might be or where there was a miscommunication. Maybe you weren't clear in what your description of that goal or the mission was. So even if that feedback is wrong in terms of what you should have done, it's still valuable to understand where that team member is coming from, where their head is, and how in the future you can lead more effectively that one team member or the group. 
yeah, it's just that it's that whole communication, you know, going both ways thing. And and you're absolutely right. I mean, you can't assume that everyone's going to understand you clearly. You can't assume you understand everything going on. It's impossible. You know, a large ship, large squadron, large organization with hundreds or thousands of people. You know, the reason you have that many people is because it takes that many people to get stuff done. And as a leader, you can't do it all. I mean, you can only do one person's worth of that. So you better understand where they're coming from, understand their challenges and understand you might not know what their challenges are. And so you better have that feedback mechanism and your leadership style that allows for that. Um, and I found that to be true all the time. I was always amazed. You know, I'd put something out over our speaker system on the ship as an example. And, you know, and I and I generally repeat myself like every day. So, if, hey, we're going to talk about our schedule. I tell the, sh the sailors what ship, you know, what port we're going to go into. You know, hey, we're going to pull into Guam. And I tell them again the next day. And then I'd walk around the ship and, you know, in my mind, I've done a good job of communicating. You know, I took the time to come on the speaker system that, that was in every space on the ship. So all 5,000 people heard it, whether they wanted to or not. And then you walk around the deck plate or, you know, in the cafeteria, the galleys, we call it in the Navy. And you talk to a sailor and you're like, hey, are you excited about pulling into Guam? And they look at you like, oh, I didn't know we were pulling in, sir. I'm like, I just, like, in your mind, like, I just told you that twice, didn't I? But, <laughs> you know, but it's a good reminder that, you know, you, you really can't over communicate, I think. And, um, and it's not mean you have to say the same thing the same way every time, but there's less risk in over communicating and there is an under communicating. And to be effective, you communicate, you get feedback, you communicate again. And you kind of build that message and, and with that, you build the culture, I think that you're after. But yeah, I was always tried to be open and getting that feedback and making sure no matter how much I did or didn't want it, uh, you did, you took it with a smile on your face and you welcomed it and, and recognize it. The win really was, they gave you the feedback. When we think about the military and its hierarchy and discipline being such a core tenant of it, that NQR almost flies in the face of what we think of the military, which is take the orders, listen to the command. It's not your time to question, just to enact accordingly. So how are you able to preach that with military training or doctrine that sometimes runs counter that, especially when you think about being in a situation on a boat together where you don't want to be speaking up in the wrong right. and then letting down 5,000 people on this city that's floating around the world? Obviously, as a leader, you're, you're setting the example for the crew and you're building the culture. And I think particularly the military, a leader can can have more influence on the culture and the success of a mission than any other position. And, and that's true, certainly on the outside as well, in the non-military roles. You have to accept, I think, and be confident enough to know you're not always going to be right as a leader. I think you also have to be comfortable and confident enough to demonstrate that. So I had, you know, my my son's, one is already out of the military, so he's a Navy veteran, and the other son is in the military. And it's sometimes interesting to see their perspective and, and hear them come home and talk about, you know, what they had to do for the day and, you know, the idea of what I, what'd you do today? And he's like, well, I, you know, we swept, we swept the, the courtyard all day in the rain. I'm like, why did you sweep in the rain? Well, I don't know. They wouldn't tell us. We just, that's what we were told to do. Did you tell anybody? Oh yeah. We told them. They just said we had to do it. Quit asking, quit asking, you know, and this is your order. So I know it exists and I know that I can't expect that everybody, uh, every leader out there is going to have the time or patience, um, you know, to explain it or, or communicate in a way that's, you know, that might instill a little more, uh, trust, I guess, and confidence. But as a leader, as you get your, as you become more senior, it's incumbent upon you to demonstrate and, and exemplify what you expect from your other leaders beneath you. You know, I knew as a CEO, if I was short tempered and I yelled at people in public, man, I just gave permission to like 5,000 other people to do exactly that. So again, err on the side of kindness, err on the side of being patient, Air on the side of accepting criticism publicly, ideally that's going to translate down the ranks as it were. There's the trickle down effect. Um, but I knew it wasn't perfect. I knew that, you know, you have, you have to be patient too, knowing you have leaders that are learning beneath you. You know, you might be a division officer and have a chief working for you. So you're the officer in an organization. You have a, a chief petty officer, a senior enlisted that works for you. That's given some of the day-to-day -day orders and they might be a little more short tempered in their style and delivery. Um, it doesn't mean you allow them to be toxic or yell at people, but you have to use the opportunity as well to mentor and develop your leaders. So it's, you know, whether that's set an example, if you're in a high enough position, or sometimes it's just the mentoring day to day and, and pulling people aside and saying, Hey, you know what? I know you think that's effective, but I got to tell you, I don't, I don't think you're going to, that's not an effective style. In fact, we'll, you know, lose people. And now that I'm in a non-military position, I see that even in the, in the outside. And, 
I think it surprised me a little bit at first when I see very you know senior people in the nonprofit world that that tend to be short tempered and uh, and yell at people more than I ever maybe I ever saw the military. And then I kind of take a step back and go, you know, the reality is they just haven't had the benefit of a lot of leadership training that I had throughout my career. They haven't had any good maybe mentorship or feedback along the way. Um, but it's absolutely something I have to address because otherwise, in this you know, in this line of work, people can quit and leave. Um, and in the military, you can't take for granted just because people can't just quit and walk off the ship that you can take advantage of that. I think you you know it's more incumbent to treat them with respect and and communicate that way. And, and so, anyways, I yeah, I, you know, I, I found even in the nonprofit world, there's leadership challenges and development requirements to to be effective, and and I address some of that stuff more than I thought I would have to. But uh, but it's good. In the book, you write about, I think, your ultimate NKR moment, a very pivotal moment in your career with COVID striking and you and your role in command of the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Can you walk us through that moment, your decision-making process, and how you dealt with the NKR? Yeah, and that's kind of, you know, it ends up being towards the end of my career, maybe the culmination of all these things I learned through almost three decades of service. And, and, you know, we were in a, in a spot like the rest of the world trying to figure out what COVID was all about. Um, what was the risk? What is it? You know, what's the impact? And so I found myself, I was the CEO of the Roosevelt. Like you said, it was March of 2020. Um, through maybe a port call or through other means, we were exposed to COVID to where I had some sailors that came down with it. And remember, this is before vaccines. This is before we even had adequate testing available. Um, the military was doing a good job of trying to react, but like the rest of the world, we were still trying to figure out what was going on. And we were watching the stuff kind of start to ravage parts of the world with some pretty high fatality rates for, for at-risk populations. Obviously on a ship, um, the things we know of now is terms like social distancing and quarantining are pretty hard to do. Uh, have you ever spent time on a, on a Navy ship? There's, there's, in some cases you have 200 people in a single birthing compartment. So, and they're, you know, everyone's in arms, distance away. So there is no such thing as six feet of separation. Uh, it's impossible. So when we had COVID and we were, and, you know, we had already reported it and we were, we pulled into Guam on the ship. So we'd stopped our operations. We pulled into Guam and it became, you know, obviously our number, my number one priority, our ship's number one priority was, okay, how do we deal with this before the spreads? And we'd watched other ships, other cruise ships, other um, cities across the country that were dealing with this and watching it spread very rapidly. And we were running our own uh, analysis. You know, and I care, you have an entire medical department, you've got doctors, you have lawyers, you have, we actually had a, uh, epidemiology team on board to help us analyze it at the time that happened to be on board because of what was going on in the world. So we were, we were being very deliberate about our planning, certainly concerned enough as we watched it spread, trying to get sailors off the ship if they were positive, trying to quarantine those that were close contact. Um, it's almost a fool's errand in that, you know, you, Within like a couple of days, we had all been within close contact. There's no other way about it. And we were just running into resistance due to, I think, what we call sometimes the fog of war. Um, you know, the theory being that what happens on the front line, by the time that information gets all the way to senior decision makers back in D.C. as an example, um, it's slow, it's cumbersome, and the information they have might not be accurate. We were faced with a little bit of that. We were seeing firsthand the impact. I was seeing the sailors that had it. We were tracking the numbers. And we were getting resistance, I think, for a variety of reasons. Some of it foreign policy. Some of it was trying to negotiate with Guam to get our sailors off into proper quarters. We knew, as we know now, the only thing we can do to really stop it is to quarantine folks and stop the spread. And we knew by stopping the spread of COVID, then we could minimize the impact and the fatality rate. And we didn't know what it was. I mean, sailors are generally pretty healthy, um, but even 1% of 1,000 is is, you know, 10 more than I was willing to sacrifice. And we knew our numbers were going to be close to 2,000 or so um, positive cases if we weren't careful. And we, that's about where we got. Um, and we, you know, eventually we do, unfortunately, le lose one, uh, a chief, uh, you know, Chief Thacker, who was one of our chiefs who succumbed to the COVID. So through all of this, we were really pushing hard to get the sailors off the ship. We were trying to communicate that up the chain of command. I think everybody... And I say this in all honesty, I think everybody wanted what was best for the sailors on the ship. Um, but I knew that no one wanted it as much as I did. Like no one spent every day, you know, side by side, building that trust, that confidence with these sailors. So I knew that 
you know, that not only am I the ship and ultimately accountable for everything that happens on that ship, I knew that, you know, my number one job, like it had been throughout my career was take care of your people, take care of your sailors. So for me, that was my focus. Um, and in the end, we weren't getting the response we wanted. We were watching the numbers increase. We were watching the risk therefore increase. And I ended up just sending a very pointed email after we had at that point exhausted all our other options um, to my, to the leadership. And it was the people within my chain of command, like, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll take full accountability for this. But at this point, all I care about is we have to remove these barriers. I have to get these sailors off the ship. I have to get them off the base and I have to get them in proper quarters. And so I knew as well, I was rocking the boat a little bit because I was, that was my NKR moment that, you know, things were just not going right. And what we had had in place at the time, our normal decision-making process seemed a little bit slow and cumbersome. And some of that I own. I mean, part of me is how well I communicate up the chain as well as down the chain to my sailors. So I own some of that. But I knew that, you know, I needed a method and a way that I could quickly communicate to the powers that be. So I wrote the email to a very small number of folks in my chain of command and asked for the help, Uh, which sometimes is hard as a leader to ask for help because you're you're trained to be a type A warrior to get stuff done. Um, But I knew at that point I needed help. I couldn't remove the strategic barriers. I couldn't work the foreign policy aspect with Guam. And I sent the email, my NKR moment or red flare signal for help. And, and I got the help. Um, I lost my job in the end result because I think I, as I rocked the boat, people were frustrated with how I handled it. Um, but in the end we got the help we needed or accelerated the help we were getting, I think is the other way to look at it. We got the sailors off the ship. We put them in hotels, we quarantined them. And then about six weeks later, they got back to sea. But they got back to sea without me because at that point, I'd been fired by the acting secretary of the Navy, who was the one I think who was probably dealing with pressures that I can only imagine from the administration at the time. And I'm often asked, like, would you do it again? And I, I say, yeah. I mean, knowing what I knew at the time, um, yeah, I'd like to think I'd do it again because it was fundamental to me. It goes back to what you had asked earlier. You know, there was, there was no textbook for this. There's no script on how you handle uh, a world pandemic. Um or, you know, what you do when you feel like you're not getting the help you need. But I knew then I fell back on my, my core beliefs as a leader. It's about taking care of people. And I figure if I do that, I keep my head high and, and I'll do all I can. Even if I get fired as a result, so be it. Uh, I'll get them the help they need. In the, the chain of command, if everyone has a lot of anxiety going on or everyone is worried or everyone wants a certain thing and you move to allow that to happen in order to fix something or to alleviate the pain or anxiety that everyone's feeling only doing what you think is best in the moment with the information that you have. And then the possibility of learning after that, that that decision was wrong or it has caused more uh, difficulty and anxiety than was induced. And then backtracking on that, that turn is going to take a lot of time. And if you don't have the the trust in in the staff as you mentioned we're pulling in the guam how you guys uh you guys excited about guam today what we're pulling in the guam it's like yeah i mean and and i you know i fully recognize that it was chaotic not just obviously you know off the ship but around the world and and we were all trying to figure out how we handle it i you know i i made it not just for my sailors obviously i thought you know in some regards too you know, the, the blowback on the Navy, if we had lost 10 sailors to COVID would have been detrimental. Um, and so in some ways I was looking at the organization, but, but in the day as a leader, you know, you're going to make the best decision you can ideally for the right reasons. It might not be perfect. Um, and you might face heat for it, but if you're making it for the right reasons, you're making it for something you believe in, then I think you can stand by it. And at the end of the day, I mean, I lost a job that I love because I could, again, any job where you can fly helicopters, fly fighters, drive the ship, uh, be well taken care of is it's a, it's a tough job to leave no matter whether you had it six months or six years. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, what's more important is that you stand up for what you believe in and you stand up for the core beliefs you had as a leader along the way. Otherwise it's all for not. If you suddenly turn your back on your beliefs to that point, well then they weren't really beliefs to begin with. You're just kind of bouncing around like a ping pong ball. So there's, there was no clear guidance. Uh, you're only making decisions without any sort of uh, any, any fundamentals to, to stand on and then losing that job. It's like how many other different ways that it could have been done, how you would have done it, how you would change things. If you stand on your principles, it's like 
Well, this is how I had to handle it due to the information I had, due to my training. And if I had the same decision to make again, it's going to go down the same way. And I can feel good about that. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, nothing's black and white, right? I think is the more you find yourself in leadership positions, it's, it's shades of gray at best. Um, so there was no easy answer. I mean, I, I did at the time what I could. I got counsel from my peers and and medical folks and everybody else. So I knew I wasn't just, you know, writing an email in a dark corner somewhere. I mean, I had people around me when I wrote and sent it. Um, but again, I knew I could live with it. And, you know, I think it's unfortunate that it went down and the Navy got some blowback for the decisions they made. And I think it's, I want to follow up too, because I think it's important for those who didn't follow the story after we, you know, we moved on to other stuff. In the end, the Navy took pretty good care of me. I didn't get back in command. I didn't get the ship that I loved and was part of. Um, but, you know, they gave me a good job. I kept flying fighters and helicopters. Uh, I lived in San Diego. And so I felt, you know, I think that was kind of the the epilogue of the story, so to speak, is that I, you know, I they didn't fire me. I mean, they fired me from that, they removed from the ship and the command, and that was unfortunate. And and certainly that created a lot of the drama. But in the end of the day, I think, you know, they, they understood why I made the decision. Uh, and they might have, some might have disagreed with it. That's okay. That's how it works. Um, but I had a great job. I had a lot of responsibility I had a big team I was working with and kept flying fighters and helicopters and, uh, you know, retired two years after that and, uh, with, you know, my boss and admirals and friends and family there and, and the Navy for us, you know, like I said earlier, my sons were in the Navy and one still is, it's still like a family business for us. So, um, you know, I'm proud of the time on there and, and I look back at this as a, a teaching moment for me, but also a lot of other people too on, on leadership and particularly when you're that kind of crucible of a decision did you ever imagine that it could end in that fashion that that they would fire you from command i think me i think i knew i was rocking the boat i mean i to the point of when i hit send one of those moments if you write the email i'm like wow this is this will be interesting to see how this plays out um i i don't know that i in all honesty i didn't think i was going to be fired at the moment i knew that i probably wasn't going to continue in my career trajectory and go on and make Admiral. I knew I would rock the boat enough that, um, that would probably mean the end I would peak at that job and I'd retire after. So, um, it def if I underestimated anything, it was probably the political reaction. Um, cause ultimately I was fired, not by the Navy. I was fired by the acting secretary of the Navy. Um, and again, who's that's, that's how the military works too. We have civilians in charge for a reason. And he was, he was empowered to do that if that's what he felt was a requirement. And I don't, you know, I might disagree with his decision, but I also understand that he's making his decision based on the influences at the time. Yeah, I think it's important perspective to have in mind because in that moment, you know, this is something that you've preached to young leaders. This is a principle you you live by, but then you're actually confronted with this exact moment in your career that has the potential to end in a way that could wipe that away from you. I think a lot of times it's easier said than done. Right? It's easy to talk about these principles. It's hard to live these principles. And I think that example really crystallized it for me in the book, just how important it is, even understanding the stakes. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not going to say it's just a job. I mean, it's it's a career. It's a profession. Um, I dedicated my life to it. But at the end of the day, you know, you're there to take care of people. You're there to be a leader. And and the question becomes, you know, is that what's more important? You know, I, 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 there was a path I could have followed to, to minimize the rest of my career. And that was just to kind of follow along and go with this, what I thought was a pretty slow bureaucratic process. To what end though? Then I'd be, maybe I'd make Admiral or maybe I'd be a senior officer, you know, or, but maybe at that point, fundamentally would have gone against everything I'd believed up to that moment. And, and that might've been, you know, I would argue that's much harder to live with in ways than it is just to take a stand when you think it's important for the right reason and then, and then deal with it. And, and reading the book, uh, upon f flying jets and helicopters and uh, the carrier, I was just like, you got to play on all the best toys and, uh, that, that, that we have. Yeah, it was, it was a fun, it was a fun career. I mean, obviously ended with that one moment, but when I look back in total, um, I mean, I, it's, I, was, I have no regrets. It was a phenomenal, feel lucky to have served and do what I did with the people I did it with. One thing I'd like to touch on, obviously talking about jets, helicopters and, captaining a ship, uh, the complexity of what we're talking about here, right? These are complex decisions impacting up to 5,000 sailors. There's a lot that goes into it, and it's easy to overanalyze, overthink, and there's a cost to that overanalysis and overthinking. 
So how did you approach these really complex decisions and situations in a way where you could act on these principles that you have and not find yourself indecision, anxiety, and not being able to work your way through when necessary? Yeah. And they, you know, they say the, the enemy of good is great. And that if you're always trying to get the perfect decision and solution, then you'll you'll miss all these other opportunities and probably spend uh, the wrong amount of time trying to analyze. I mean, I think data is important. I think you need to have some foundation by which you make those decisions. As you get more experience, though, now you're relying on that experience and that and this you know your in intuition that you've developed over time as well. And I think that's why you don't take a, a young supercharged, you know, lieutenant and put them in charge of an aircraft carrier. They just don't have the same experience and arguably you'd, you'd set them up for failure because they don't even have that analytical ability. Um, over time, over, you know, when you learn how to think as a leader, as you spend that time along the way, I think you have to, the data is important. I think you want to make most of your decisions with some kind of data or information that allows you to be founded, but you also have to trust your instincts. You have to trust your intuition. Um, I think, to be honest, you know, maybe as, uh, as a pilot, as a helicopter or fighter pilot and with combat missions, I think maybe that gives you a sense of confidence and an ability to know that, you know, you, you face things that are many times much more risky um, and you've just had to rely on intuition and, and training. Um, and that, I think, sometimes gives you the ability to then, you know, when you're in those decisions, those bigger decisions that affect a large organization, make the right call. I mean, I find it even now, like I'm we're faced with decisions as an organization and, and we're just totally overanalyze it. In my mind, I'm thinking, you know, no one's going to die from this. If we get this wrong or no one's going to care if we pick the wrong menu item for Sunday bunch brunches or something. Um, so in those cases, you know, I, it's like, I don't want to spend my time making these kind of decisions. I want to think about the big decisions and I feel comfortable enough to, to be intuitive about what the right things are to do. But, but when you get to those, that's where I think the TR decision with COVID was, it was a decision that it was going to impact um, 5,000 people or more. Um, there was a lot of data, but it wasn't a perfect amount of data. I definitely had to rely on a little bit of intuition and, and the advice of all the team, you know, the team I'd build around me, the docs and the, the analysts. Um, and then you make your best call you can, and you just kind of have to, if there's a chance to make the decision and then adjust fire, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a decision that's reversible, then you can make a decision and you can always go back and, so that was a big one. I think in general, though, I mean, oftentimes in society and even in the military, we tend to want to make decisions as if they're all irreversible. And there's a whole theory on type one versus type two decisions. Um, not all decisions are irreversible. Now, if you're in combat dropping a bomb, that becomes pretty irreversible. Uh, once you push, you know, you pickle and you drop the bomb off your airplane um, in most cases. So in general, though, when you're making decisions in staff or you're making decisions on where the ship's going to go, they're, they're not irreversible. You, you have the ability to get a lot of advice, but you also don't need to spend 100% of your time to get that perfect, great solution. It's probably 80% is probably good enough because you want to spend your time on those other irreversible decisions when they come up. Um, and that is a tough, I, again, I go back to what we said at the beginning. I mean, we're, we're overwhelmed with information these days. We have so many analytical tools and, and database managers and stuff and and it becomes hard. If you're trying to always make that perfect decision, you might never make a decision. Uh, or when you finally do, you've ignored three or four other things that needed your attention. Um, and as a leader, we vote with our time. And I think you have to know how to prioritize. So when you're, you know, use the data that's available, use the intuition you have, seek advice and counsel. Um, but again, this is where, I mean, the decision making as a leader is one of the most important things you do. You know, you, you make decisions and how you do that relies on all the things we've talked about today, trust, relationships, feedback, data, you know, your core moral principles. Um, and ideally, you know, you get it right. You won't always get it right. But, you know, I think if you understand how to prioritize, and you understand what it takes to make a decision, you'll, you'll do okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and your NKR moment with us. We love asking every guest what their X factor is. What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary? I've learned at an early age just, you know, that, that no one's better than anybody else. I think that I approach every relationship like I've got something to learn more than I have something to give. And I think um, that allows me to approach relationships, whether it's espresso in Italy or or, you know, sailors on the ship or even veteran clients that I have in the, in the shelter I work with now where they're coming off the street, you know, it's very easy to look at somebody who's been living on the street for months on end and get them in a shelter and, and think that they have nothing to teach you. But, um, I think 
I think you'd be surprised. There's a lot to learn from everybody. So I try to approach every relationship as if I got something to learn. Um, I hope I can give something back, but in the end, I, I, I think everybody has something to share and there's, uh, that's, that's kind of in my strategy. I don't think it's unique. I think probably there's others that do that as well, but, um, so that, and I'm a very mediocre surfer. So that's, you know, I've got a lot to learn there too, <laughs> despite the title of the book. Well, hopefully you have more time to surf now. Yes. i some days I wish I had more, but it's, uh, <laughs> I'd surf when I can and make the most of it. Well, thank you for sharing these lessons and learnings with us and our audience. Where can they find out more about the book and the work that you do with your veteran charity? Yeah. If you go to uh, surfwhenyoucan.com, you can, um, the book's released June 13th. So you can buy it from the website or you can go to Barnes and Noble and Amazon. And if you go to that website, I've got a link to uh, nonprofit causes that are important to me, whether it's Veterans Village of San Diego, where I work now, or others, I think that are a way to give back to those in need. So yeah, I encourage you to check it out and find what uh, motivates you. And uh, if you like the book, let me know, but uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. We did. Thank you so much, Brett. This was awesome. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. 